Okay, we would like to have a discourse today about a little story, namely a Shoah story, a story about the friendly woman, a Jewish woman in uh, uh, Germany in the past, in the 30s, 40s. And um, this, of course, happens in our own context. And we had here in Michigan, the governor Whitmer had protesters who carried nooses reminding us of lynching of uh, um, African-Americans. And then they had a Confederate flag, which devalidated the uh, Civil War and the victory and the liberation of the um, slaves. And then they had swastikas, of course, to remind us of the uh, fascist movement in Europe 70 years ago. And so we want to make a connection between what happened then and what is happening with us. So the Michigan militia marched into the state house and intimidated the government. And that was even too much for the um, Fox News uh, that um, they, even they protested against the protest. And they carried weapons on top of this. So that shows our present uh, situation here in this, uh, in our country here. Um, the uh, um, Simon Wiesenthal Institute also uh, told us that there is an explosion of anti-Semitism again, as we had it 70 years ago. Simon Wiesenthal was liberated from the Mauthausen concentration camp, and uh, 75 years later, the world is experiencing this explosion of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred in the midst of this present uh, crisis. Years after his liberation, Mr. Wiesenthal, who uh, spent his whole life in order to establish justice and um, so that the victims had not died in vain, he wanted to have justice for the murderers. And he predicted at that time, 75 years ago, the combination of hatred and technology and economic crisis is the greatest danger threatening mankind. And um, today, this, his words could not be more true. So the anti-Semites have been hard at work using social media and technology to blame Jews for the coronavirus, accusing them of profiting off the crisis, and even urging people who catch the virus to visit synagogues to infect Jews. That is our present situation. So in this context, I would like to um, read the story or part of the story as far as we come, and um, then we can discuss the issue and make the connection between then and now. So the title of my paper is The Friendly Jewish Lady of Frankfurt, and um, the encounter with the friendly Jewish woman happened in Frankfurt, which had a large Jewish community in March 1941. Almost three years after the Kristallnacht, or the night of the broken class, or the November pogrom from November 9th to 10th, 1938. It was carried out by paramilitary SA forces and civilians throughout Germany in the framework of the fascist exclusive identity philosophy of life and ideology and politics, while the German authorities looked on without intervening, ideology understood here as false consciousness, masking of particular economic and political interests, shortly the untruth. When on November 9th, 1938, at five o'clock in the afternoon, I came as an 11-year-old boy whose father had just died from four months earlier from cancer, out of the central Frankfurt swimming pool, I saw the famous inner city synagogue nearby burning to the ground. Many police and firemen were present, but nobody even tried to extinguish the fire. Firemen and fire engines only protected the swimming pool and other buildings nearby from the flames, but left the old synagogue to its fate. <laughs> Throughout the decades, this old synagogue had been visited by famous Jewish mystical thinkers like Martin Buber, and more recently also 
the Orthodox family of Erich Fromm and the half-Jewish family of Theodor Wiesengrund Adorno, who lived on the rich east side of Frankfurt, at least knew, at least they knew about this synagogue. I myself, who was educated in the, uh, uh, on the west side, in the west side Catholic parish, St. Familia, knew nothing about the old synagogue, so high were the interfaith walls. When I walked to my home on the working class west side of Frankfurt and across the Zeil, Frankfurt's main street, I saw all kinds of communities flying out of the windows of large Jewish stores, including crystal lamps, which gave the night from November 8th to 10th its name. At the time, there was nobody on the otherwise very busy main street of Frankfurt. It all made no sense. Only in the evening, after having returned home, I heard on the Volksempfänger, that means a small radio which everybody had in fascist Germany, in my mother's kitchen of the assassination of the German diplomat Ernst von Rath by Herschel Grün's son, a young Jewish refugee in Paris on the 9th of November 1938. And in retaliation, eye for eye, the imprisonment of 30,000 Jewish men and even the killing of some of them. The persecution of the Jewish people had fully begun in Frankfurt and all over Germany on the basis of the Nuremberg laws as climactic expression of the exclusive fascist identity, ideology, and politics, which were patterned after the American racial laws, <coughs> with the exception that in Germany, the Jews were considered to be Semites and thus as being colored, while in the United States, they were categorized as being white, a fact of which the German fascists were very critical. Fascism is white nationalism pushed to the extreme. At the time, Jews in America may not have been discriminated in the same way as blacks and Mexicans, but they were openly discriminated against, more so in the South, but socially also in the North. It was only after World War II that Jews really became white, as Karen Brodkin in her book, How Jews Become, Became White Folks and what that says about race in America of 2018, put it. That was two of other uh, nominally white groups like the Italians or Irish. The German fascists made an experiment in order to prove that even in America, the Jews, in spite of being legally considered to be white or Europeans or Aryans, were not really wanted. Adolf Hitler sent a ship full of Jews to Havana, Cuba, which at the time was under U.S. control. As foreseen by the German fascists, the Cuban authorities under U.S. directive did not allow the ship to disembark in Havana. The old captain from the German World War I Navy took his ship up to New York. Here the ship received coal and water and food, but the Jewish passengers were not allowed to leave it. Hitler had made his point. There was exclusive identity ideology and politics and anti-Semitism also in the United States where the Jews were not colored. The old German captain took his ship back to Europe in order to rescue the Jews from, from, German fasc uh, from, German, um, from the Germans, uh, from German fascist identity politics, he did um, not return to Germany, but won his ship against a rock very close to the British coast. All the passengers were rescued, but then the British authorities put the Jews into internment camps. Later on, the Jews were sent to Holland and Belgium, where they were captured by the German troops after the invasion of these countries and put into German concentration camps, labor camps, as well as death camps. <laughs> it happened up it happened on one rainy day in March 1941 that I drove with my bicycle from the Jewish home or my Jewish from my, my new home um, in Frankfurt in the Friede or peace settlement for veterans from World War I in Frankfurt to the Lessing Gymnasium, my high school. My home was very near to the house of Anna Frank where she lived in the first three years of her life. 
before her family had to flee to Holland from fascist persecution, only to be captured there later on. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing had been the great German enlightener who wrote the novel Nathan the, the Wise, Nathan the Wise, about the three rings of Judaism, the religion of sublimity, Christianity, the religion of becoming, freedom and manifestation, and Islam, the religion of law. Nathan did not know any longer which ring was the true one. My uncle, Dr. Karl Sieber, the judge in Thuringia, where in 1945 American and Russian troops, the post-European American and Slavic worlds met, had put me into this elite school shortly before the death of my father, his brother, so that I would receive a classical humanistic education, including Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, as he once did. Since my father was an electrician in the Jewish Itzeha Schneider shoe factory in Frankfurt, I became something like a token proletarian in the elite bourgeois high school. There were also token girls in my all-boy high school. There were also token Jews in my all-Aryan school, who slowly disappeared without any explanation. On this morning in March, my bicycle malfunctioned. The chain fell off. I had to walk and push my bicycle to my school. When I had walked halfway and um, passed by the huge, very modern IG Farben administration building of the largest chemical corporation in Germany, which had sided with Adolf Hitler and his National Soci Socialistic Arbeiterpartei, or National Socialist German Labour Party, the NSDAP, and his government, and had paid him from the start, as so many other large corporations, like, for instance, Krupp and Thyssen, Siemens and Bosch, and, of course, Ford had done. I saw before me an old lady in a black winter coat who carried on each side two large suitcases. She had a hard time to walk and had to stop after a few steps to put her heavy load down on the wet road and to rest for a while. When I caught up with the old lady, I noticed the large yellow star uh, of David on her black coat. Um, in the Hitler Youth, which I had to belong to by law, besides being voluntarily a member in the Catholic Youth Movement and in the Humanistic Lessing Gymnasium, we had learned not to speak to any Jewish person. In contrast, in the, in the Catholic youth movement, uh, the priests had told us that what happened to the Jews was immoral and criminal. In spite of centuries of Catholic and Protestant anti-Semitism, or rather anti-Judaism, because the Jews had supposedly killed Christ and because their refusal to convert prevented his return. I was neither in my family nor in my parish, Sancta Familia, nor in the Lessing Gymnasium, ever taught to hate the Jews, but uh, to the contrary, rather, to respect them and to love them as the older brothers. Not only did my father, a uh, Catholic by birth, and my mother, a uh, 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 convert to Catholicism from Lutheranism, work for a, few, for a Jewish owner, the Itzea Schneider shoe factory called shortly Ikas, but my mother also visited the Jewish wife of her Aryan supervisor weekly throughout the war in order to console her. Uh, console her. She was frightened whenever the bell was ringing on the door throughout the war. On the day when the war ended in, on May 9th, 1945, she collapsed and died. With this background, I had no problem to start to talk to the old Jewish lady, in spite of the Star of David and all the anti-Semitic prejudices permeating the German culture <coughs> at the time, and the authoritarian populism and the exclusive fascist identity ideology and politics. That was additionally made easy by her looking rather very friendly at me, in spite of the fact that she was very shy and first did not want to speak at all following the fascist exclusive identity taboo. 
But then her friendliness overcame her shyness and all prejudices and taboos, and she told me that in the last night the police had come to her apartment in my neighborhood and had told her to take all her possessions which she could possibly carry and go to the nearby air shelter of the Lessing Gymnasium in order to meet other Jews from Frankfurt. From the Lessing Gymnasium, she and the other Jews would then be transported by bus and train to a village in Eastern Europe where she would be protected from the hustle and bustle of the big city of Frankfurt and could rest and live out her golden years in peace. The Jewish lady spoke high German with a slight Frankfurt and Hessian accent like my parents and grandparents did. She never introduced herself and I never told her my name. We remained anonymous. The Jewish lady believed what the policeman had told her in the middle of the night and so did I, in spite of the fact that we both knew that there were concentration camps in Germany and in Eastern Europe. We did not know yet that the labor camps were turning into a death camps. The, um, particularly in the eastern part of Poland and in Russia. Three times Hitler had shouted in public, uh, Hitler had shouted in public speeches in Parliament in Berlin that if the Jewish high finance, that means Rothschild, the Rothschild family from Frankfurt, or today in Paris and in New York, <coughs> could once more push the Europeans into a new fratricidal world war, that this would not mean the end of Europe, but rather the end of the Jewish race. That moment came with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Unaware of all this, the Jewish lady followed the command of the police and was thus on the way to the air shelter of the Lessing Gymnasium. I, motivated by my Catholic conscience, finally asked her if I could put her heavy suitcases on my otherwise useless bicycle and drive them down to the Lessing Gymnasium where I was going anyway. <laughs> she accepted gladly and was very grateful and happy for this help and support. Thus together we walked down the hill from the IG Farben administration building where we had met to the air shelter of the Lessing Gymnasium along the school's soccer field. We were talking about my experiences as a pupil in the humanistic gymnasium, some of whose teachers still believed in all seriousness in the Olympian gods of the Trinitarian Greek religion of fate and beauty, and in the prosaic gods of the likewise Trinitarian Roman religion of utility, and still visited them every summer during vacations. At the same time, these teachers were forced by the fascist culture minister in Berlin to um, teach students about the inferior gods of the Trinitarian Gothic, Gothic religion of blood and soil, which they despised. All this happened in a school <coughs> which confessed through its name to be a part of the Unitarian secular enlightenment, which wanted to make people rational and to free them from their fears and to make them into masters of their fate and to transform what was unconscious into consciousness and to place ego where it was. Ever since my encounter with the friendly Jewish lady, I was throughout my life concerned with the problem that so often people have to make important moral decisions while being completely ignorant of the immediate or immediate context, circumstances and consequences of their actions. While I thought on this fateful morning on March 1941 in terms of the Catholic ethics and also of that of Emmanuel Levinas, that I did an act of kindness and maybe even a heroic deed when I carried the suitcases of the friendly Jewish lady to the air shelter of the Lessing Gymnasium, in reality I did not make history and I did not prevent the Shoah. To the contrary, I helped the elderly Jewish lady to walk not only to the air shelter, but beyond it to a labor camp and maybe even to a death camp in Eastern Europe. At best, I helped myself and gave my life an anti-Semitic anti, anti, anti direction 
and shows the option of an inclusive identity philosophy and theology and politics, tearing down walls rather than building them, lowering the in-group, out-group barriers as the Good Samaritan had done when he when he rescued and healed the Jew who had fallen among robbers and uh, murderers. We both, the Jewish lady and I, should of course have asked ourselves what an over 70 year old woman who could hardly carry her suitcases should do in a concentration camp, which after all was a work camp with the motif Arbeit macht frei or work makes free on the entrance door, in reality providing massive unpaid surplus labor and profit for the German private capitalistic industry. But we did not. What was worse was that we did not know and were completely unconscious of what happened in the IG Farben administration building in front of which we met, and in the IG Farben factories in nearby Frankfurt Höchst. It was a long story. Before World War I, the German Jewish chemist Ritz Haber had received the Nobel Peace Prize in chemistry in Norway in 1918 for his invention of the Haber-Bosch process, a method used in industry to synthesize ammonia from a nitrogen and hydrogen gas. This invention was of importance for the large-scale synthesis of fertilizers and explosives. Haber was born in Breslau, Germany after World War II, renamed after Polish Wroclaw on December 9, 1868, and died in Basel, Switzerland as refugee from Nazi Germany on January 29, 1934, one year after Hitler came into power. Haber's invention doubled the world food supply and thereby falsified and devalidated the Anglican priest Malthus's food population calculation, which until today, 2020, does not prevent bourgeois countries to follow Malthus, who had for children himself <coughs> in their birth control policies, and even socialist countries in spite of Marx's Darwinian Malthus critique. Before World War I, Haber was a pacifist, like his friend, the Jewish quantum physicist Albert Einstein. But when in August 1915 the German army got stuck in the West Harbor in order to end the war and thus save lives, as they always do, weaponized gas and became the father of the gas war. He applied his new weapon the first time in Uben in August 1915. 4,000 French and British soldiers died in this first gas attack. While Harbor celebrated his victory in Berlin, his first wife, Clara Imewa, took his revolver and killed herself in the backyard as a gesture of protest and warning. She, also being a chemist, was not only a good positivist, but also the better dialectician. The thesis provokes and elicits the antithesis. She knew, as her name says, the truth as the opposite of ideology. She knew that the opponent would counteract. The British invented the gas mask and better forms of poison gas. In the process, Haber responded with developing also a German gas mask, as well as chlorine and other poisonous gases, and maybe even mustard gas, which could penetrate French and British gas masks. As late as the first Bush administration, U.S. Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld gave mustard gas to Saddam Hussein for his war against Iran. At the end of World War I, millions of soldiers had been killed and wounded by gas. Hitler was blinded during a British gas attack and was in a hospital in East Prussia when three young Jewish messengers announced to him and his comrades that there had been an armistice and that the war was lost and that the emperor had fled to Holland. Um, Hitler would never forget the, uh, the three Jewish uh, messengers. <clears throat> After the successful gas attack of 1915, Haber was promoted to captain and maybe even to general in the German army. He would not listen to the warning of his wiser wife, Clara. Two years after her suicide in 1915, Haber married again another Jewish woman, Charlotte Nathan 
1927. Her last name suggesting Nathan Devise, the main figure in Lessing's novel of the same name. She died 10 years later in 1927. After the end of World War II, uh, the Allies wanted to put, uh, World War I, the Allies wanted to put on trial Haber, the father of the gas war, as a war criminal. <coughs> Haber fled to Basel in Switzerland and let his beard grow so that nobody would recognize him. But in 1918, Haber came out of hiding, nevertheless, in order to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, not for being the father of chemical warfare, but rather for the invention of the Haber-Bosch process. The German parliament in Berlin declared Haber to be a hero of the nation. The increase of the food supply brought about an increase of insects. Thus, Haber started a new business and industry in East Germany, producing insecticides called cyclones. IG Farben produced Cyclone B, which since the Wannsee decision of the final solution under SS leader Heydrich was used to murder Jews and others in Eastern European death camps. The father of my good friend Gregory Baum was the adjutant of General Harbour in World War I. Gregory was the member of an assimilated Jewish family in Berlin. He covered, he converted to Catholicism and became a priest and an Augustinian Aramite monk in Canada. <laughs> During the revolutionary 1960s and 1970s, Gregory, having been exposed not only to the Marxian, but also to the Freudian Enlightenment, came in conflict with the authorities in the Vatican, whom he had served well for a decade, concerning their five new rules on sexuality. The moral issue was not settled. Gregory was forbidden by the Roman authorities to hear confession. Gregory finally left the monastery and the priesthood and was excommunicated because he married without legalization. Gregory devoted his whole life to an inclusive identity, theology and politics, and thus to justice and peace. During and after the First World War, the family Baum in Berlin was very proud of the fathers having been the adjutant of General Harbour. Gregory departed from his beloved mother in Berlin, railroad station, shortly before World War II, in order to be transported with other Jewish children to England and Canada. Gregory had thought throughout the war that his mother had been imprisoned and gassed in a fascist concentration camp in Eastern Europe. But in reality, she had survived and had been trained as a nurse and had worked as such in a Jewish hospital in Berlin up to her death during an epidemic. When after the war, Gregory often traveled to Berlin and met old fascists who had produced such suffering to his family, he did not only not hate them, but he tried even to understand them with compassion and mercy, what possibly motivated not only General Harbour and also his own father, the latter's adjutant, but also the Nazis up to his death in 2017. Uh, Racist, um, nationalism, fascism, yes. The Hitler government did not appreciate the Jew Harbour's uh, scientific and military ac accomplishments for the fatherland. His gas was not used in military campaigns during World War II, but only in the Eastern European fascist death camps and later on in the Iran war and the Syrian war. So let me close up with the uh, delivery of the Jewish woman into the air shelter. When the Jewish lady and I arrived at the entrance of the air shelter of the Lessing Gymnasium with my bicycle and her suitcase on it, we heard from below the voices of many people, Jews from all over Frankfurt. Soon a young SS man from the Schutzstaffel, a major paramilitary organization under Hitler and the Nazi party and Heinrich Himmler came running up the staircase from the air shelter uh, basement uh, below. The SS was recruited from the German bourgeoisie. Its members had often the same classical humanistic education, which I received in the Lessing Gymnasium. <coughs> After a bloody Jewish pogrom initiated by the SS, for instance, in Warsaw or elsewhere, they could easily play on the next leftover piano 
Beethoven's or Mozart's bourgeois revolutionary symphonies in the midst of the ruins they themselves had caused. The competing opposite of the SS was the SA, the Sturmabteilung or Assault Division by named Sturmtruppers or Brown Shirts, part of the Nazi party, also a paramilitary organization. Their methods of violent intimidation played a large role, role, uh, role, in, Adolf, role in Adolf Hitler's rise to power. The SA was recruited from the German proletariat and was much less educated. Not the SA, but part of the SS, besides the SS elite tank divisions, was in charge of the concentration camps, first as labor and finally as death camps. When the young SS man in his attractive black uniform with his skulls on the collar approached us with a list of names under his arm, he looked us over for a while as if he could not comprehend what he saw. As a matter of fact, he was so shocked by what he saw that he could not speak for some time. Then he composed himself and started to shout with the loudest commando voice so that all the teachers and students in the classrooms of the Lessing Gymnasium could hear it. How can you, as an Aryan boy, carry the suitcases of a Jewish pig? It is a scandal. I answered him that the old Jewish woman did not look like a pig, but rather like my grandmother at home. Uh, that response made the assessment even angrier, as if he suspected that I, that I had a Jewish grandmother. But that was not the case. My father's Bruno Siebert's bourgeois family tree was totally Aryan, down to the 10th, uh, 16th century. Admittedly, my mother Ellie and her brother Adolf looked Jewish and were often suspected of being Jewish. Adolf, working in the Dresdner Bank in Frankfurt throughout his life, became a member of the NSDAP early on because he hoped thereby to protect himself against racist, anti-Semitic suspicions as part of the exclusive right-wing identity, ideology, and politics. <clears throat> but nobody could prove my mother's or uncle's Jewishness since there existed no written proletarian family trees in the working class pop family. But through my research and investigation in Protestant church archives throughout Upper Hesse after the war, I found out that my mother's family were Protestant Huguenots who fled from France after the Catholic Bartholomew massacre in Paris in the 16th century and were accepted by the Prince of Hessen and were thus Aryans. But that a Jew had indeed entered the family around 1700. That was more than seven generations ago and was therefore no longer valid, not even for the mistaken, perverted fascist anthropology of race and exclusive identity ideology and politics and the Nuremberg race laws. However, in March 1941, the SS man remained nevertheless so angry that he pushed the Jewish lady down the staircase into the air shelter basement and her two suitcases after her after I had taken uh, there from them from my bicycle. I did not even have time to say goodbye to the friendly old Jewish lady from Frankfurt in the general turmoil around. I would never see the Jewish lady again after our short meeting and friendship. Her last look at me when she descended the staircase and entered the door of the air shelter, was still friendly, but also very frightened. Do we have a minute maybe to close up or? Just a few yeah. lines. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure, yes. In his anger, the SS man took me and my bicycle to the director of the Lessing Gymnasium, Dr. Silomon, who was one of the so-called noble Nazis, who had written a book on the Indo-Germanic language community the SS men shouted at him as well. What kind of students do you educate here? They help Jewish pigs carrying their suitcases. It is a shame. <coughs> the SS men demanded that I had to be punished for my treacherous non-German deed. Dr. Silomon remained silent. He just looked at me sadly as if he wanted to say, why did you have to do this to us? I must admit to the honor of the Lessing Gymnasium that I was never punished for my helping the Jewish lady. 
Four years later, after the end of the war, I witnessed to that in my teachers' denazification procedures in their favor, and they were grateful for this, since most of them had been um, in the party, formerly, only formerly members of the NSDAP, without conviction and only in order to save their jobs. I saw Dr. Silomon the last time after he had been drafted with my whole class into the Air Force and was stationed in Mannheim in order to defend the city against daily American and British uh, saturation bombings. Dr. Silomon came to our flag position in order to teach us history in the Indo-Germanic perspective. During an American attack, I was laying beside Dr. Silomon in an earth hole for protection against the bombs. As the part pathfinder ahead of 500 Liberty bombers produced in Detroit posited his uh, smoke signal right above us, I asked the very pale old Dr. Silomon, where are the Indo-German German tribesmen now? Where is Henry Ford? The bombardment started and I never received an answer from my teacher. In any case, the Aryan race solidarity had not worked in World War I when England was allied with Japan against Germany, nor in World War II when Germany was allied with Japan against the United States and England. Okay, I close here.